My name is Mohamed Al Ansari. I'm a partner developer advocate as part of the DevRel team for Workspace. I'm based out of Toronto, Canada. Um, and I do work with partners, day in, day out. So whether they're ISVs, uh, SaaS partners, or system integrators, my role is to make sure that they can build quality integrations with Workspace with ease. So if you have any questions after this, you know, that relates to building Workspace, feel free to grab me and uh, happy to talk more. But back to service accounts. I think the, the premise of today is, you know, um, should you use a service account or stick with the standard or auth uh, user credential process when developing an integration for Workspace. So how many of you, by a show of hands, knows about service accounts? Okay, cool, a handful, that's great. All right, so we'll talk about service accounts overall and how they relate to Workspace development. We'll talk about some sample use cases on when to use them. Uh, we'll have some best practices that shows you Again, like how to best use them within your development environment. And then we'll go through a decision matrix, just like a quick decision, like when would you use <coughs> auth user credentials versus service accounts. We'll have a few resources to wrap up, and then uh, we'll pause for any Q&A. All right. So Workspace is designed for collaboration between people, right? And we keep saying that, you know, whether it's Gmail, Calendar, Drive, Docs, they're all centered around humans doing things. But sometimes your integration, your application, wants to do something that either on its own or on behalf of some of your users. And although I'm, all, I'm sure you're all familiar with the uh, you know, default consent, lovely consent screen, you know, how many of you have used that? Yeah, um, I guess everyone, yes. So, and that's the traditional way of authenticating, right? Like you, you build your auth consent screen, you show it to the user, you ask for permission, and then uh, based of the token that you get back, you use that to call the APIs on their behalf, and that respects the permissions and everything that they've given you, and that's the normal way. So, for example, this is a, a sample of the Lucid chart, I think, um, and you can see all the permissions that shows up. But again, if your application wants to do things on user's behalf or in the background, we'll talk about more of the use cases, then this is where you use a service account. And essentially, a service account is a non-human user account that provides an, an identity for your application. You create it through a GCP, a Google Cloud project, uh, and you give it roles and permissions to call APIs. <coughs> Once created, it will have this you know, long, weird email address, the service account name, add the project ID, .google.com, et cetera. <coughs> but you're also going to generate a key that allows you to generate a token to call the APIs using that service account uh, identity. And service accounts are very useful, specifically when you're calling external APIs. Like, you know, let's say that you have an application that calls Vertex AI. And you don't want to give each user in your domain access to Vertex AI. So this is when you create a service account and give that service account a role or access to the APIs they want to use, and you have more control over it. So how do you use a service account? Uh, there are really two steps. The first step is creating the service account itself, and the other one is how to use it to generate tokens. Uh, for creating the service account, you use the Google Cloud Console, uh, you create a service account through the IAM permissions uh, panel in the uh, Google Cloud project that you're using. Optional, you can assign specific roles, like a Vertex AI user, etc. And then you need to create and download a key, a pair of public-private keys that is downloadable in JSON format that you will store somewhere within your application. And that key is what you will use to generate tokens so that you can access the APIs you want to access. So for generating the tokens, you will use one of Google API client libraries. Um, you will feed it the JSON file that has your client secrets and ID. And then that is the key will generate what we call a JSON web token, a JOT, that has the required scope that you need to call the APIs. And then it's going to exchange that file <coughs> or that sign, you know, web token with an access token. And then once you get that access token, then you will use that to call the APIs. Now, not all APIs, not all workspace APIs support service accounts. So because service accounts are not real workspace users, they don't follow the concept of you know, their own data. Uh, 
you know, they don't have their calendar, they don't have their drive, although we'll talk about some minor distinction with that in a second. But when you call the calendar APIs, for example, service accounts can't own events. You know, they can modify events, et cetera, but they can't own an event. They don't own a calendar. Uh, in Google Drive, they don't own files because they don't have a My Drive concept. So, you know, we'll talk about how to work around that and how to give those accounts access to certain files or shared folders so they can still do you know, certain actions using drive files. But it also means, because they're not users, they can't call some other APIs. So there is no Gmail API equivalent for server accounts, because again, they don't have an inbox. And with Google Meet, you, know, you can't use them either. So if you try to use a service account like a regular user, it really will end up in some unexpected errors or limitations, as we talked about. So, Mohammed, if you say, like, these are all the limitations of service account, like, why would I even bother with those? Like, when would I actually use them? So, the first use case is Google Chat Apps. <clears throat> we started with Google Chat Bots, you know, they were named to apps, but they're really just bots. You know, they're, they're non-human participants in conversations, and they need an identity. You know, and that identity is the service account. So, with that service account, they are able to call the chat APIs to post a message, respond to a slash command, or do whatever it wants, authenticate it as its own identity. So that's one of the main or first reasons that you would use a user account, uh, sorry, a service account. Now, the other use case is Drive APIs. So although service accounts don't get quotas or permission, sorry, or their own drive, they can still act on files. And the way you do that is you give them permission. So with that email address that we've shown before, you can give them permission to certain files or folders or shared drives. And based on the permissions that you give them, they can execute actions on that data. So if you give them a viewer access, they can copy and view files. If you give them editor access, they can move files around. <clears throat> so while the ownership of the file stays within the shared drive, the service accounts can act as a user within the permissions you give it by sharing it with that specific email. And I did mention that there is some caveat around the My Drive quota. Now, if you have created a service account before March 15th, 2025, then it did have a My Drive with some storage quota. But the challenge with that is it doesn't respect all of Google Workspace um, admin settings and policies. So things like default sharing rules, data regionalization, retention policies, or classifications don't work. And that's why we don't recommend that you use service accounts <coughs> as actual workspace users. Now, if you created the service account after March 15, 2025, then it doesn't have that My Drive concept at all, which makes it easier. So our recommendation is, if you have legacy service accounts, you do not use them to create items, right? Stores in their own My Drive. Again, you just share a drive or a shared drive with them, and then they can act within the permissions given for that shared drive. Now, other use case is the automation of admin tasks. So, service accounts can be given permission to the admin SDK roles within your Google Workspace organization. This can be very helpful if you want to provision new user accounts, if you're managing groups, if you want to change settings <coughs> based on some internal workflow, or do anything else that an admin would typically do that you want to automate in the background. So, that's one of the better uses for service accounts. And the last, what I call a superpower, you know, grant carefully, is service account, surprisingly, can act on a user behalf by impersonating that user. So domain-wide delegation is a special option that you can enable for a service account where that account can act as any user in your organization. Now, this can be very helpful in uh, administrative security and compliance tools. For example, imagine that you have uh, a compliance tool that needs to scan a user's email. It cannot do that unless it either gets consent from the user, and you really don't want every user to give consent to your app, uh, although you can do that through admin um, you know, console. But with a service account that has the ability to impersonate user, it can access that user's inbox without the user giving consent. Now, the admin will give consent, consent for those scopes for the service account, uh, but essentially, the service account is able to act as if it was that logged-in user. Um, 
Another thing would be, for example, scanning drive files, you know, for compliance or a DLP or any of their use cases. The same thing, you know, it will require that domain-wide delegation so that it can scan a user's file as if it was the user itself. It's a powerful, requires careful security consideration, but really enables critical back-end processes. Now, let's take a look at some of the best practices when using service accounts. The number one rule is create a single purpose service account. <coughs> now, usually you might be tempted to create one service account for your entire application or integration that has access to different roles, different APIs, etc. But really the best practice is create a single purpose. If you're creating a domain-wide delegation integration with Drive, for example, create one service account for that. If you're doing a different use case within your application, create a different use, uh, service account for it. And what follows is, you know, use a specific naming and documentation convention because as you've seen, you know, the email that the service account has can be really lengthy. And if you don't know how you're naming them, it can be a struggle. You need to keep an extra list on what each account is used for. But if you have your own naming convention that talks about, that describes what a service account does, you know, what projects it belongs to, which application, then it makes it easier to audit and monitor. Now, when you create a service account, the first thing you're gonna do is create a key for it. And automatically, Chrome will download the key for you. Now, make sure that you get that key and store it in a secure manner. It is a secret, so don't leave it in your downloads folder. Uh, certainly don't submit it to your source code repository. You know, it's the same thing as any other secret that you would handle with a secret manager. So make sure it's not checked in and it can be really tricky because it is just a file. Sometimes you will just add it to your project and if you don't ignore it through get ignore or something else, then it just gets checked in. So if that happens, you know, disable the uh, service account. So this is part of your overall maintenance of the accounts. Uh, have a periodic review of, you know, all the accounts that you have, um, identify, disable any unused ones, but also rotate the keys regularly. And by rotating the keys, it means that you have a limited window if there is a compromise for that service account. You know, if anything gets compromised and the key is rotated, then it's no longer valid. And last but not least, when you use domain-wide delegation, use it only when absolutely necessary. It is really a powerful tool that can enable um, some critical admin stuff, but only use it sparingly. Now, as a review, We've talked about you know, all different use cases for service accounts. How do you decide when to use this or when do you use uh, OAuth? Well, basically, if your app needs to act on behalf of a user to create, modify, or delete their data, then you use user authentication. You want that interaction with the user or with the admin to give you specific permissions to scopes that you would then use within you know, the access tokens to act on the user behalf. But if you want the your application to act on its own, um, to collaborate, to do admin tasks, to automate stuff, or access user uh, data using domain-wide delegation, then that's when a, use, a service account will be really helpful. Now, if you want to continue learning about service accounts, there are a couple of pages. One of them is about access credentials for Google Workspace, so that's the one on the left. And specifically to Google Chat and uh, the different authentication mechanism within Google Chat, you have the um, other page on the right that will show you, that will talk really at length about how a Google Chat app can authenticate. You can still use app authentication or user authentication. So it's a really nice guide about <coughs> these topics.